Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Astro Coffee Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work I work at DeepAstronomy.com, and we've got a really great hangout plan for you today where we're going to be talking about exoplanets. And in particular, we're going to be discussing a specific kind of exoplanet called a hot Jupiter. My guests today are astronomers from Princeton University who have been looking at these hot Jupiters through a project they're calling the HAT Project, which we'll talk all about here as we progress. And they have found a couple of interesting looking hot Jupiters. And now hot Jupiters are, are they're, as their name implies, they're roughly the size of our planet Jupiter, uh, but they tend to warp at their star very quickly uh, within less uh, a period of about 10 days or less. And so we'll go into all those nitty gritty details and we'll talk about these new findings that our guests have had. But before I do, let me introduce my co-host, Dr. Carol Christian, who is back from a really cool trip. Hi, Carol. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, Good to be back. Yeah, you're semi, semi jet lagged, but you just got back from... Semi jet lagged, yeah. <laughs> you just got back from Venice, so welcome back. And one day we need to talk about this, this exhibit that's going on yes, as it's well a out there. fabulous Hubble exhibit. <laughs> All right, so why don't you uh, introduce our hangouts to our, you know, to our audience, like what, you know, what we're doing, who the, who the sponsors are, and things like that. Sure. So the idea with afternoon astronomy coffee is that most of us in research institutions, we, ha we have something called science coffee. And it might be in the morning, might be in the afternoon with tea, whatever. And we sit around and talk about recent results. We, te we tend to talk among our colleagues. Sometimes we talk about research being done in our own institution, but sometimes we talk about um, th things that we've read or things that we've heard about or conferences that we've gone to. And so the idea it was, wow, there are other people besides scientists who are interested in these topics. And in addition, wouldn't it be great, instead of just talking among ourselves, to talk to the people who really did the research and try to figure out, like, why they did, what, what problem were they interested in, how they crafted the research they were going to do, and uh, what the results were and what they're going to do next. So that's the idea. It's very informal. We have some visuals to help the, the dialogue. And uh, so it, this isn't a presentation type, it's, a, it's really a discussion. Just like we were sitting around having coffee, tea, or in this case, sparkling water. <laughs> um, and our sponsors yeah, are, sure that's what it is. we're sponsored by the American Astronomical Society and um, also endorsed by the American Astronautical Society because very often we have some engineers on board who are members of those, that professional society. So we're very grateful for the sponsorship and endorsement of our professional societies because we really like to represent what's going on in astronomy as far as research and also the technologies that we use, which are pretty interesting too in their own right. Exactly. All right. And because this is a, a live event, we are currently being broadcast on YouTube right now. We want you to take this moment. Hopefully you're watching. I see many of you watching now to interact with our guests. It's not often you're going to get direct access to astronomers from Princeton University. So we hope you will take advantage of it. You can Esteemed do that in several ways. Esteemed astronomers. Esteemed astronomers. Okay. I stand corrected. Thanks, girl. <laughs> so so you, can, uh, you can interact with us in a couple of really great ways. The best way is go to deepastronomy.com slash live. I have a live chat client there. I like that chat client because it's calm, it's tame, and and the the uh, comments are easy to extract from there. I'm also, however, looking at the YouTube live chat uh, as well. I see a lot of you are joining now. So uh, leave your questions and comments. I will, I will, many of you are commenting that you wish I would spend more time on questions and comments. I will try to do that if there are some. Okay, but if I don't see enough, then it's my job to keep the discussion rolling. So if you want to take over the discussion, by all means, leave some <laughs> questions for me, and I'm happy to let you drive the hangout, okay? So uh, finally, we're also using the hashtag, uh, uh, the Twitter hashtag, Astro Coffee. We don't have lower thirds anymore because like, the Google took that away. So anyway, now those are the best ways to interact with us. So our guests today are from Princeton University. We have uh, astronomers joining uh, joining us from the astronomy department here with me is Dr. Joel Hartman. He's an astronomer at Princeton University and the leader of the team who wrote the particular paper we're talking about today. Hi, Joel. Welcome. Hi. Also is uh, Dr. Adam Burroughs. He's a professor of astrophysical sciences at Princeton. Hi, Di Adam. It's good to see you. You too. And also joining me is Kal Kalyan uh, Perev. Uh, Penev, sorry, uh, he is the he's also an astronomer at Princeton, and he and all three of these guys work on something called the Hat Project, 
And uh, we're going to be talking about what that is as well. So let me start with you, uh, Joel, if I could, and uh, give us a little bit of background on we, we, we've, we've had Hangouts on exoplanets before. Uh, we've talked about what they are. Uh, these are planets that are in, or in orbit around stars, uh, other stars in our galaxy and uh, elsewhere. And so, but this particular one, we're, we're going to be talking about a subclass called Hot Jupiter. So can you give us a little background on what they are and some of their characteristics? Sure. Um, so hot Jupiters are planets like Jupiter or Saturn. They're gas giant planets. Um, masses greater than, say, 0.3 Jupiter masses um, on very short period orbits around their stars. So that take them around their star in less than, say, 10 days. Um, many of them with periods even of one or two Earth days and some even with periods less than a day. Um, these planets uh, have extreme uh, irradiation that they receive, and their their upper atmospheres are heated to very high temperatures. You know, in excess in some cases of 2,000 degrees Kelvin. So they're really unlike anything that's in our own solar system. Um, uh, these planets are also typically the easiest ones to find. Um, they we our own project looks for them via transits, and when a planet passes in front of a star, um, it produces these. Uh, dips in the brightness of the star. Um, and the size of those dips depends on the size of the planet. And for a hot Jupiter, which is sort of the biggest planet you can find, uh, they produce really deep dips that are easy to detect. And because they're also very close to the stars, they transit a lot. And so you can see lots of these dips. And so we know of several hundred of these planets, but they're actually very rare. Um, maybe half a percent of all stars like the sun in our galaxy have a planet like this. Um, but there's a lot of uh, mysteries associated with them. Um, I guess we could say that hot Jupiter is sort of the first uh, type of planet, uh, exoplanet that was found um, in large numbers around other stars. And you know, just the fact that they exist is still a mystery. We don't really, in our theories of how planets form, we don't, nobody expected to see a planet like uh, Jupiter at such a close orbital period. Uh, and that's really not understood yet why, how they, how they get there. Um, another mystery associated with them is um, we are extremely large, and that's what, what the paper that um, we're presenting talks about is focused on. But some of them are in size up to twice the radius of Jupiter, and that's, that's also unexpected. It's a lot larger than you would predict such a planet could be. Um, and there's, there's several other, I guess, mysterious things about them as well, I would say. Um, Okay, well, we could get maybe to some of those as we progress here, but the, the and I want to also talk about the two Jupiters that you guys uh, address in your paper, but by the way, the paper that um, that we're talking about, I put a link to it in the description box of the video on YouTube, uh, and you can follow along if you'd like uh, as well to sort of, if you want to read the, the paper itself. So that's the paper we're discussing. But um, Joe, getting back to the topic of, of hot Jupiters, these are... They're, they're relatively easy to see because they're physically large, but they, we, because we detect them by the, by the transit method, that's the going in, that's the, the light dips that you're talking about as it travels, as the planet travels between us and the star, we don't really know, that doesn't really tell us what they're made of, does it? So can we, can, can we say anything else besides the fact that they're physically large, presumably they're hot because they're so close? Uh, is there anything, I mean, is uh, yeah. there... Go ahead. You can you, the, actually the, the when when the planet passes in front of the star and you get um, you see these transits. There's a number of other details that you can measure uh, about the planet. Um, one thing you can do is study the um, atmosphere to try to get a, a spectrum of the of the planet. And this is this is something that Adam I think could uh, could tell okay. you tell you more about. Okay. Why don't you go ahead, Adam? Tell us a little bit about that. What 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 more can we learn about these with the transit method than we than just their size? Well. When you see the size uh, as, as large as uh, Jupiter, you know that it has to be made predominantly of hydrogen. There's only hydrogen-rich objects that can be that large. Uh, so that gives you some sort of constraint. But the apparent size is actually a function of wavelength. And so even though not in hat, but in other, by other means, one can look at transits as a function of wavelength. And because there are atmospheres, the apparent size of the planet is a function of the optical depth, how uh, opaque the atmosphere is. If uh, you look at a wavelength where um, light can uh, go through uh, the uh, atmosphere fairly easily, then the apparent size of the planet is actually smaller because you have uh, 
to uh, get an impact parameter, a distance from the center of the planet uh, at which you would get a large optical depth uh, of, or uh, one of order unity at smaller radius. And so you get a, an ersatz spectrum by looking at the apparent size of the planet, the, the dip as a function of wavelength. So and that will reflect the composition of the atmosphere. So you can actually infer composition by doing transits at multiple wavelengths. Would that, so would that entail something like you look at this thing, you measure a transit using one filter of a certain wavelength, you, because they only go around in less than in, in such a short period of time, this, <laughs> 10 days is their year, folks. I mean, that's their year. So it, it, that you wait a few more days till it comes around again. You look at it in another uh, way. Well, you can actually do it simultaneously, but yes, you can oh, do it. Oh, of course. You sure, sure you can. Of course you can. So you put several filters up and you look at right. the size. Right. And so there are characteristic features of water or carbon monoxide or sodium or potassium, et cetera. We've seen all these in exoplanet transit spectra. Okay. And so Joel. We compositions. And Joel, did you say when you were introducing them that they, that they these are, they're uh, roughly, they're Jupiter like? Are they gas giants as well? Yeah. Um, so based two things you can measure for the planets are the, the radius of the planet and its mass. Uh, the mass you get from radio velocity measurements of the host star. Um, and from those two numbers, you can compute a bulk density, and that tells you something about the composition. And you can tell that these things have to have very large um, extended gas envelopes. Um, if, if you had a Jupiter mass object that was you know, made entirely of iron, it'd be extremely compact and it'd produce a much shallower transit. Yeah, I don't... Um, so we know they're we know they're gas giant planets, yeah. Okay, so I don't want to go too much into this because you guys, if anybody who's watched our hangouts before knows about the transit and radio velocity methods for detecting them, but I'll briefly remind you, the radio velocity method measures this sort of tug, the side to side tug of the planet as or as it's pulling against its star, and it shifts the spectrum a little bit, and you can get some sense of the mass that way. So the mass coupled with its size can tell you a lot about what it's made of. In addition to uh, what Adam said about the uh, looking at it at different wavelengths to get their sizes to kind of see what it's made of. So we can get a lot of information from these exoplanets using these two things. And and so, uh, Kyla, let me get you in on this a little bit. What are some of the, what did you guys use to look at these exoplanets with? Tell us a little bit about the instruments. So the, for our instruments are actually uh, basically telephoto lenses in the north. So we really literally use camera lenses and we put detectors behind. And for the Southern project, we use very small telescopes. Uh, okay. It's called the HAT project, right? And well, there's actually three of them, two that are currently operating and one that's being built. Okay. So let me pull up a, an image here. Hang on. That's not the right one. Sorry. I'm, uh, so this is the one that you guys used in, um, in Chile, correct? Yes. Yes. All right. And, and the and the telephoto lenses that you're talking about would have so, been. So so these are the the yellow tubes are actually small telescopes. So in the southern these hemisphere, are. we use uh, slightly we use actual telescopes instead of telephoto lenses. Okay. But can, if yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say if you the the northern project is literally uses I'm not sure if it's Canon or Nikon lenses, but. But it's uh, it's literally lenses that you buy out of the store for your camera. I know. I'm trying to find that image. What was it called, guys? No, no, was it? You just hit it. You I just, just hit it. Yeah. this one. No, but it doesn't show yes. the telephoto yeah. lenses. Well, oh. one of them is poking above the dome, but yeah. Oh, okay. All it's right. It's just a night image, so you don't see a lot of detail. Oh, I know what it was. I was thinking of. I was thinking of the thing we're going to go to, which was Hat Pie. That's what I was thinking about. Okay, you're right. So that's down the road. We'll talk about that in a minute. So this is this is the one up in the north. So the the telephoto lenses are up in these boxes here. Yes, and the boxes are there just to protect us from weather and from the sun. All right. So, how uh, presumably are they are they wide field images? Or I mean, here's a here's an example I have of a typical image, right? So, uh, what's the can you give us some sense of the field of view that we're that we're looking at with these? Uh, well, this is a sub uh, part of the image. It's a small part from what I can see. Ah, the so actual image. So the actual image is much bigger than this. But uh, yeah, so the, they're about 10 degrees on the side from uh, more or less. From here to here, uh, not from here to here, but not from, from uh, no, that, yes. this is a subset here. Okay. Yes, but if you, 
Yes, if you if you have the full full image, that will be about ten degrees on the side. Now, because you're using the transit method, you presumably need to have a pretty high image cadence, right? You need to be able to take a lot of images, one after another, to get the the light curve that you need. Is that correct? Yes, we take an image every few minutes. Okay, so you take an image every few minutes, and so here's a typical example of one of the two uh, stars that you guys were looking at um, for this paper, and. So we've given you a background on hot Jupiters. We've talked about the fact that there's a little, they're easier to see. They have really fi they really uh, fast periods around their star, and they, which means that there's you know because of that we can see a lot of them from the ground. Uh, we can't necessarily see uh, you know some anything smaller. And you guys can comment on how what the limit is. How, well, why don't you just say what is the limit of what we can see from the ground as far as planet size? Uh, well, so it depends on what you're using, really, right? With bigger telescopes, if you, uh, if someone tells you to go look at a particular star, you can confirm a very small planet. But with these wide field images, you're usually restricted to, to a planet that blocks at least, you know, one one thousandth of its uh, of the light from its star, or okay. something of that order. So that's a good point. So if you know what to look for, you can get really down and dirty and you see really minute dips in brightness from the ground. But if you don't, and you've got a real watt, you're trying to get a lot of the sky at once, then your sensitivity goes down quite a bit, right? Yes. Right, because it's a trade-off between, you know, if you have the size, it, it, often the, the field of view is very small, and so you, you tend not to use those for surveys. Right, you can't do a survey with a big <laughs> <laughs> Unless somebody gives you a big telescope to do a survey with. So. <laughs> right. And so according to the Wikipedia entry I read on hot Jupiters, as well as the description that Carol wrote on uh, what they are, they're typically smaller than our Jupiter. Is that correct? Or they're, they're not quite as large as Jupiter, right? Generally? Um, I, don't, I, I guess it, it depends on what you mean by by size. So in radius, they're actually typically larger than, than Jupiter. Most of the hot Jupiters are inflated relative to Jupiter. In mass, the they range in, in, in masses from, say, a third the mass of Jupiter to, you see some even 10 times the mass of Jupiter. Um, sort of what we define, what we call a Jupiter versus a super Jupiter versus a, you know, Saturn or whatever, it's, that's kind of arbitrary. But the, the masses are a Jupiter mass-ish, and then the radii are generally bigger than Jupiter. Okay, so uh, yeah, you're right. I just reread the article, and it just <laughs> it said that they are physically similar to Jupiter, but have a very short orbital radii. So I don't know where I got the fact that they were smaller than Jupiter from, but the uh, but the ones that let's talk about the the the, the two that you guys found, um, Joel. Uh, you guys were using the uh, the Hat Network, and you you published a paper on two uh, hot Jupiters that you found. Describe a little bit about what what they were. Uh, yeah, so the the two particular pot Jupiters that uh, were you know announced in this paper, Hat P sixty five B and Hat P sixty six B, they're the just the sixty fifth and sixty sixth such planets from the Hat Northern Hat uh, survey. They're they're a pair of planets um, with radii that are even larger than your average hot Jupiter. So one of them has a radius that's 1.9 times the radius of Jupiter, and the other has a radius of 1.6 times the radius of Jupiter. So um, we sometimes call these things extremely inflated or very inflated hot Jupiters, just because you know we like to throw in lots of acronyms um, to make things sound even bigger, I guess. Um, so just for context, the big, the biggest planet that's been found is, I, I think it's WASP-79. Uh, uh, it's a planet found by by another survey, um, uh, the WASP survey, which which also finds many of these 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 objects. Uh, that one has a radius that's about two point one times the radius of Jupiter. Um, and there's there's real, a couple other planets that have been found with radii up to this this size. Um, and the distinguishing feature of all of these very inflated planets seems to be that they're extremely irradiated compared to. Um, to to other hot Jupiters, so these are the ones which for which the equilibrium temperatures are upwards of two thousand Kelvin. What's an equilibrium um, temperature? So so when you say bigger, you are specifically referring to this inflation in the diameter, but the masses, at least of the two that Adam was talking about, are, are smaller. Or somebody yeah, mentioned yeah, so they're 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 actually in mass smaller, right? Right. Yeah. So in mass, they're they're smaller, and then the 
I mean, from a I, from a theoretical point of view, you you sort of expect the radius to be constant for a, a gas giant planet, more or less, as a function over a very broad range of masses, from you know Saturn almost up to the smallest stars. They're all basically Jupiter radius. But for many of these hot Jupiters, you find that that they are actually very very large, up to twice the the radius of Jupiter. Um, and that effect seems to be correlated with um, how much uh, their star, so how close they are and how bright their star is. Um, and so these two objects also are, are fairly heavily irradiated. And one other thing we noticed about them is that they're also around stars that are fairly old. Um, they're, not, they're not giant stars yet, but they're right at the end of their main sequence lifetime. Um, and so that's actually, I think, what was the most interesting thing about this particular paper is that um, we, we decided to look a little bit more into that in detail to see whether that's actually a general trend for for these hot Jupiters, and we concluded that in fact, if you if you you know calculate the the fractional age of all of these 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 objects and plot fractional age versus radius, you do see a a, a significant correlation between the ages of these planets and the, their their radii. Wow, are they going to be swallowed by their parent? I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Presumably, they, all of these eventually would all be destroyed once their 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 stars go into the giant phase. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, there's a lot to digest in what you just said. I want to make sure I got it. I'm following along. The you said that these hot Jupiters are generally found in older main sequence stars. Yeah. So we found that the the largest ones are more commonly found uh, around older stars um, than the smaller planets. But that doesn't mean that they didn't form along with the rest of the solar that system, right? I mean, would it have been captured or something? I, mean, I don't, I don't. If I understand how planets form in, in, around, you know, in the standard solar solar system sort of model that you always see with them condensing from protoplanetary disks and things like that, what they would have always been there, right? The age of the star shouldn't. I'm, I'm confused as to how the age of the star right. matters with the hot, hot Jupiters. Isn't it just yeah, the way so they, you're observing? I, I'm just presenting this as sort of like an empirical fact, right? And then the, that's the observation. And then the, the interpretation is that um, we think actually what's happening is that the stars, as they get um, as they get older, we, we on sort of a theoretical basis, we know that stars, as they evolve, they get hotter and brighter. Um, so what we think is actually happening is that the that the as the stars get get hotter, they irradiate their planets more, and the planets puff up and get bigger and bigger and ah, bigger. And that's okay, what we're, thank actually, you. I understand. we're actually seeing. Okay, so yeah, so it's it's an artifact of it being that the system is older. It's not like it got captured or anything like that. They were sitting there, they were normal normal star, normal hot Jupiter, and then as it gets older, something's happening with the star, which is affecting ah, okay. its so the hot, planet. The hot Jupiter was always there, it just got super yeah. inflated. Uh, as the star got older, you think I that th might be what's I, going on. I think, yeah, I think that's what Joel said. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So, I guess um, the, the this if that's true that the that the that the um, that the planets are actually being dynamically inflated by their stars as they as the stars get hotter and brighter and um, irradiate the planet more, that actually has a lot of implications for understanding how these planets are so large in the first place and and sort of the interior processes inside of these planets. And that's something I won't want I don't want to talk about too much myself with Adam uh, Burroughs, who's you know one of the world's experts on this whole you know, the theory of all these things, uh, you know, here. So I, 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 I defer I to think, him. Well, I, th I think we should add, ask him to comment then. Go ahead, Adam. Well, the anomaly in these sorts of data, the anomaly of the hot uh, inflated Jupiters is that the default theory would give uh, about the same radius over two orders of magnitude and mass around Jupiter. Um, you would go from Saturn's mass to 10 Jupiter masses, and you don't change by more than about 30%. Now, there's an age dependence, and there's an irradiation dependence in the general theory. So, indeed, if you're irradiated a little bit more, you expect a little larger radius. The problem is that we don't expect the radii to be that large, as large as we're seeing. And what's being uh, indicated is that, particularly with this uh, apparent uh, empirical correlation between the uh, irradiation and the size is that there are aspects of the interaction between the star and the star's light and the planet that we do not understand because when we heat these planets 
the atmosphere re-radiates that heat pretty efficiently. And that heat does not penetrate into the interior. What you need is power in the interior we have not identified. Oh, it's that's a very small amount of power that would actually inflate it. But the irradiation itself, by this simple theory, would be reprocessed just in the outer patina of the planet and be re-radiated and would not inflate the planet to the degree we see. So the, the empirical evidence that these things are inflated is an indication that we do not understand the interaction between stellar light and planetary evolution. Some of that light seems to be leaking into the interior in a way we do not understand. Or, as you say, there's some heat source in, inside that's causing the inflation. It could be an extra heat source, but uh, we can't, that's even more radical. It's very possible. All you need is maybe 1% of the irradiation to penetrate in the interior in a way the models currently don't allow for you to inflate these uh, as much as you need. Only 1%. That may seem as though, well, I mean, why, why worry about this? 1% is an easy thing to get. But the atmospheres have optical depths, number of mean free paths, thicknesses that are a 1,000 or so or more, up to a million, uh, when uh, an optical depth of one is enough to give you some obscuration. So there is profound opacity between the upper atmosphere of the planet and the interior, which needs to accept some heat in order to actually puff up. This is so the anomaly. I, so I just don't, you said the words optical depth, that's just a measure of how opaque something is. I mean, I know that's an oversimplification, but yeah, is, sure. there any, that's, sure. is, that, is that a fair well, way to say it? Well, if you take a slab and you send light through it, let's say a, a glass of beer, and you send light through it, the thicker the glass, the more beer you have, the darker it is on the other side. When you have a glass of beer Or that, you have Guinness. <laughs> okay. You need, a, you need a smaller you glass of Guinness. A smaller glass of Guinness will give you uh, the same optical depth. Okay. Um, so, so Guinness has a lower optical depth than, say, Bud Light. No, it has a it's higher, higher. optical. Oh, so, sorry, other way around. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so, so that actually makes me think about what you what you were speaking about about measuring the transits in the different mm -hmm. um, wavelengths because that's it sounds like that's really important to know because you're trying to measure this, right? You're looking at I composition and what the optical depth is and how it varies. Hmm. When the transit technique was introduced more than a decade and a half ago, uh, it was uh, not the technique that people had thought was going to advance the field. But yeah. it allows you, because the signals are so large for giants and because the signal is a function of wavelength, to get a spectrum for the atmosphere that is easier to get than by seeing the light of the planet directly by its own emission. You can do the latter, and we've seen that, but that's a much harder uh, proposition. The transit technique allows you, if it's transiting, uh, to actually get a spectrum that you can interpret uh, much more easily. And when we uh, hopefully get JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, the follow-on to the Hubble Space Telescope, in space and working, it will transform the field because it has panchromatic capability from the optical to the mid-infrared to do these types of transit measurements at high, very high precision and break open the subject. Through its, through its uh, near spec and uh, the, the spectrometer. Through the multiple so, instruments yeah, that, that right. collectively give you the, the broad range of wavelength capabilities. And okay. you can do these transits, follow up on objects that have been studied from space and from the ground already, but with much more precision and with, with uh, much more data. And so I think it's going to be a, a revolution in our understanding of the subject. And this is really what uh, will break it open. Right. Okay. I just want to take a quick break and remind everybody that you are watching an, an afternoon astronomy coffee hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. This is a Deep Astronomy Channel. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Carol Christian from the Center for Emerging Media. And we are talking about hot Jupiter exoplanets to, uh, this week, uh, in particular two very unusual ones that were found by my guests, which are who are Dr. Joel Hartman, Dr. Adam Burroughs, and uh, and. Uh, uh, Kalyan uh, Penev, for, all from Princeton University, using a, a the something called a hatnet, which is a 
a, a ground-based uh, observatory where they were measuring these light curves uh, for these hot Jupiters. And we uh, want to just want to welcome everybody. I want to get a comment in from uh, from one of the guys on from uh, Yurik Mazino, who's who, who's asking on the Deep Astronomy chat room. He goes, "I wonder if hot Jupiters are rare because if they, I wonder if hot Jupiters are rare because if they meet certain criteria, they'd form a binary star system." Is that how binary star systems occur? Anybody want to comment on this relationship between uh, if the rarity and also the is there I, a I would, threshold would, for being a binary star? Uh, I would suggest there may be another interpretation. We expect giant planets to form near where Jupiter and Saturn are now found in our solar system. The anomaly is that you find them very close to their central stars where they shouldn't be allowed to form. And so there may be only a small fraction of those giant planets that can scatter in or be or migrate in by dint of dynamical processes early in the life of the uh, planetary system that could become hot Jupiters. There may be many more Jupiters, but the hot Jupiters uh, uh, require extra steps, dynamical steps to bring them from outside to the inside because we haven't been able to figure out how to form them where they where we see them. Is that because of the, just the pressure from the star, or the, you know, what? What would what would? Keep it's them the from temperatures. Forming? It's hot. It's it's hard. It's hard to get enough mass at those temperatures actually to condense. Um, and then there's a mechanism that seems to be uh, at play, which is the so-called core accretion model, where there's a nucleus forms that may be a, a a terrestrial planet like the Earth, but much fatter, or an ice giant like Uranus or Neptune that reaches a critical mass. And when it does so, it catastrophically accretes matter in its vicinity to form the giant planet. To form that core um, seems to require distance. You need cold objects to condense out. And the proximity is not uh, where they're found is not uh, uh, have temperatures that would uh, are conducive to the formation of these nuclei. Wow. So the anomaly is the the presence of objects that may be uh, in profusion, in fact, in the solar system, in the, not the solar system, the galaxy, but um, have a hard time uh, migrating into the interior and, and, and stopping the migration and surviving in that region. So, yeah. Just a related question, just real quickly. Are there many hot Jupiters in binary systems where two stars have formed together and then you know there there are cases where there are two stars formed together planets have been found are there hot jupiters in those systems yes so we know of some hot jupiters around mm. a wide binary so where you oh, have so they're very far. very wide far apart and one's around a one of the components in fact that's been speculated as a possible mechanism for producing uh, encouraging the migration of these these hot Jupiters into their close in orbits in the first place. Um, the statistics aren't entirely clear, but it seems like, in fact, there are probably a fair number of hot Jupiters around stars where you don't see any evidence of binarity. So there's that it's not clear cut whether or not that's actually the mechanism or in mechanism. But we don't know any hot Jupiters that orbit, you know, two stars. It's just, you know, the, the, it's unstable. So we know of some circumbinary planets from Kepler where a planet orbits two stars at once. But in those cases, the planet is quite a bit further out from, from both of the stars than the orbital period of the two stars. Okay. Uh, so I have another question from Hans Milling. Hi, Hans. It's good to see you again. He goes, uh, he's asking, when the gas planet is that close to the star, is the planet a perfect sphere or does the gravity from the star pull the atmosphere and deform it? Good question, Hans. Anyone? Uh, Kahlo, maybe. It does. Kahlo? <laughs> yeah, so it, it does deform the planet, actually quite measurably in some cases, thanks to the and, and the planet also deforms the star. And actually, the latter has been measured with photometry. From using the ultra-precise photometry that Kepler delivers, you can see that, that the, at least the planet has distorted the star. Uh, and of course, the same thing happens for the planet. And the way you see it is, if you imagine the star is like a football that's rotating, sometimes it has the uh, long axis pointing toward you, so you see a smaller cross-section for the football, so you're getting less light. And sometimes it turns on its side and you see it have a bigger area so the it appears brighter. And that, that has actually been detected and, and measured. Wow. 
Okay. Well, I want to move to uh, this. I want to get get a few words in about the uh, the uh, uh, Hat Pie project that you guys are working on. Uh, uh, Kala, would that be something you could comment for us on what that is, or or anyone? I want to talk a little uh, bit about either Mitch or Joe or Happy okay. to talk about that. Again, so, what is t tell us about the the next stage? I think it's the next stage in what you guys are going to be working on uh, called Hat Pie. Let me pull up the website. Okay, All right, go ahead. So, so Hat Pie is this basically this hedgehog of lenses. So we're putting uh, a lot of small lenses, sixty three to be precise, on a single mount. So a mount is usually where you attach the telescope that takes care of tracking, so it compensates for the rotation of the Earth to go the other way. Otherwise, your stars would be moving on your detector, etc. And the goal of this instrument is really to image the entire sky at once. So we're, I guess in some sense, we're being greedy. We don't want to miss anything. We want to see anything that's going on in the sky, uh, at least above the site that's, that is housing this, uh, and be able to record it. And okay. we actually have prototyped a lot of this already. We have pieces of this attached to our existing telescopes, and it's performing really well. So. It's ex it will be very exciting once it's built, at least for us. Yeah. So the the goal of this this instrument, like the the, the especially new thing that would provide um, that's different from our existing ground based surveys, is to find planets to longer orbital periods. Um, so we'd be looking at warm Jupiters or or even potentially Jupiters on you know Earth like periods, or um, if you wait long enough, Jupiters on Jupiter like periods. Uh, the reason is that because you're continuously observing the whole sky, you, you're you much less likely to miss these very rare transits that happen once every you know year. Um, and so you actually would be able to find, start finding and probing some of the these detailed properties of, of planets on longer orbital periods. Um, Kepler, the Kepler space mission, which uh, many people probably have heard of. Oh, yes. Um, is has been phenomenally successful at finding all sorts of transiting planets um, with much smaller radii than we can get from the ground and much, with much longer orbital periods. But the problem with Kepler is that it it, it uses a big telescope and it stared at a very small, relatively small region of the sky. Um, so most of the stars that it looked at are quite faint. Um, and that brightness actually matters a lot when it comes to doing um, all of these follow-up observations, say, to measure the mass of the planet or to get a spectrum that Adam was talking about before, you need a bright star to be able to get a lot of photons to get high signal to noise to detect these very subtle phenomena. Um, and be, being able to observe the entire sky means you'll actually be able to, to see the few long period uh, gas giant planets or, or, or even potentially Neptune sized planets on long orbital periods around bright stars. Okay. Um... I just uh, so I was looking at my next question that I was going to ask, and that is from Philip W is asking a question for Joel or anyone else who wants to answer. This is from the Google or this is from the YouTube chat window. He's going. He's asking if the star's power diminishes over time, and the hot Jupiter was inflated when the host star heated up, would the hot Jupiter then shrink as it cooled? Yeah. So in that that hypothetical situation, the expectation is these planets. Um, lose heat over time. They're, the, the, they're, they're radiating thermal emission. Um, and that cools off the core. And it's really the, the heat in the core is, is the thing that's setting, to, in some level, the, the radius of the planet. And so as, it, as, as the core cools off, the, the whole planet should shrink and cr contract. So if you took the star away, then you'd expect them to slowly contract again. Okay, and this is a related question to for, for uh, Galaxia on the uh, Deep Astronomy chat. Hi, Galaxia. It's good to see you again. I'm glad you could make it. She's uh, she's asking. So the core couldn't have formed before the star is a full blown star. Is there any sense of when that core could have developed? Well, we think that the uh, planet formation and star formation are are, are contemporary. Uh, so uh, the uh, planets are formed in the context of star formation, probably in the disks out of which the, the star is formed. Uh, there's a timing differencing, uh, differences as well. So the star forms a bit earlier than the planets by and large. It's thought that the Earth, for example, took about 50 to 100 million years to form. It's thought that Jupiter may have taken 
less than a million years to form. Uh, but those are uh, very, very, that's, those are very, very small times, short times compared to the 4.56 billion years that the sun's been around. Okay. You guys are making my job easy. You guys are driving this hangout. Now I got a couple more here. Here's a good one from John Suffolk. Is it possible for there to be rogue hot Jupiters, ones that are not orbiting a star for one reason or another? I mean, kind of the definition of a hot Jupiter is that it's close to the star, right? But it has a right. Star, it's has a, it's hot. <laughs> right. It's close to the star. Yeah. But can you have these just being out there? Well, I guess yeah, we know of. Well, go on, Joel. Uh, we, we certainly know of, um, or people have pointed to examples of planets that's where there a Jupiter-sized planet that's free-floating and not orbiting a star, and people detect it through its thermal emission and and estimate its 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 luminosity and estimate that it's a, it's a it's a planet. Um, but it, as as you as you you know deduced it, it, it you wouldn't be a hot Jupiter because it's not orbiting a star that would heat it up. Be kind of a brown dwarf then. <laughs> oh, it would be a cold Jupiter. The cold, the cold Jupiter. Yeah, what okay. distinguishes a brown dwarf from a giant planet may be just semantic. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to get at in some of these hangouts. It's like, what's the difference? Uh, Philip W's got another question for us. Um, question for the panel. How would spectrographs deal with planets, especially Gantz giants, in star systems surrounded by nebulae? Would we still be able to know its chemical makeup? I mean, that goes back to... It goes back to what Adam was saying about, you know, looking at these things in a variety of instruments. What If they're in a nebulae, does that mess everything up? If you can see the star, uh, you, there shouldn't be a problem. If there's dust in the way, you won't see either. Uh, so that's not, a, that's not a major issue. Once the star is identified, then you just go at it, do the survey, find the thing, then follow up. It doesn't mean that it's going to be that much easier, but it'll probably not be any harder. Okay. Um, yeah, and Alexander Reinders, you're commenting. We just addressed that. Are some hot Jupiters around stars also brown dwarfs? I mean, we just talked about that. It's probably uh, be cold Jupiters, and it's probably a matter of semantics what <laughs> what the difference is. Um, the uh, uh, Patrick Demarta is asking: Will our Jupiter, our our Jovian planet, become hot when the sun grows into a red giant? That's a good question. Yes. <laughs> it will get hot. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it will okay, be hotter than it is today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I mean, the, the, the luminosity of the sun is going to go up quite a bit, and right. uh, it the uh, if if the Jupiter is at about the same distance it is now, then uh, the temperature will go up correspondingly. Surface temperature. Now, the indications from these hat observations that are being reported here. Um, uh, are that in fact uh, the planet will uh, inflate? Um, so Jupiter might inflate before being engulfed. Yeah. So that, yeah, I guess. But I'm I'm a little confused only because you still really aren't sure. You didn't sound sure before anyway uh, about this, Adam, when you were saying that the 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 stars radiating onto the planet didn't it should just re radiate away. There must be something we don't understand. What do you think? I mean, do you do you think that it's that it's there's some mechanism going on in the core, or do you think that it's just something maybe think, in the composition we don't yet know? I don't think it's a compositional thing, and I don't think there's an extra mechanism like a little bit of thermonuclear burning or some, some <laughs> chemistry or something. That, that although people have suggested things like that, um, I think that the, the the ultimate power source is going to be the star that somehow a fraction of that energy is being funneled into the interior. One of the suggestions uh, is that um, the irradiation causes winds that can also generate various uh, waves in the atmospheres that can propagate inwards, not like, well, like sound waves, but perhaps uh, like uh, what are called gravity waves or ripples on the surface of a pond, but they can actually penetrate into the interior. And um, if they uh, survive, uh, that's not so clear. Uh, if, and if the power is sufficient, then uh, if they, they do penetrate in the interior, they can be a, uh, a power source that could inflate the planet. Another is, and that's the, the preferred model, it's preferred only because it's exotic and nobody has any better explanations, <laughs> um, is that uh, there are magnetic fields in these planets and uh, there are winds and circulation in the in the planet atmospheres, and um, 
those uh, atmospheres can be uh, partially charged, and so you can have currents flowing through magnetic fields. And when you have currents through magnetic fields, you have two things. One is you have a magnetic torque, just like a dynamo, a magnetic torque on the atmosphere itself, affecting the dynamics of the motion of the zonal flows and winds, such as we see on Jupiter, such as we experience on the Earth when we have jet streams and winds. Um, but you can also get what's called joule heating. It's resistive heating, just like a current going through a wire. And that type of heating may be the heating source. So ultimately, the sun's irradiation would cause the circulation, which would be associated with currents, which in the magnetic field would uh, dissipate partially some of that original energy into perhaps some of the interior. It has to be in the interior. If it does it in the atmosphere, it re-radiates it. Okay, so which magnetic field are you? I'm so glad you brought up magnetic fields because I've got a question. But which which magnetic field are you talking about? The one from the planet or the star? It would be the planet. Okay, and well, we know I, Jupiter has a, a large, a modest magnetic field, and it's very reasonable that these objects would have magnetic fields. The problem is we don't have any really direct access to confirming the the, the presence and magnitude of the fields. So we just hypothesize these fields. And we could put in, you know, garbage in, garbage out. We could get powers, perhaps, <laughs> that would be adequate. But you really have to find a, a – you have to demonstrate that the fields are sufficient right. for the particular object you're trying to study to actually give you the effects that would do – would give you the inflation. Right. And I can appreciate that magnetic fields are very difficult to measure. We've only just now started getting a handle on our own sun's magnetic field uh, as far as measurements are concerned. But I want to talk about the star's magnetic field. It would seem to me, and this is related to a question that Gav that Gavarnos has on, on YouTube. He's, uh, uh, we're, we're talking about the, these hot Jupiters are close to the star now. So if the, if the sun or if the star is anything like ours, which is being a main sequence, it might be, should have a magnetic field that's being very close to that magnetic field. And Gavarnos is asking, and I want to extend that a little bit, with just the tools that we have, can we extrapolate that it is possible these balls of gas are close enough to the corona of, that star, of the star so that they turn their gases into a plasma and I'm just going to ask, what about the corona of the star? Is It's presumably being affected by it. The planet is being affected by it in some way, right? Does anybody else want to handle that question? Or do you want me to? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Hello? Joel, I'm uh, muted himself. Uh, well, I, there, there have been some observational suggestions that um, that there is a connection in some way between stellar activity um, measured on the on the on the star um and and the pl presence of a planet and so this would be in effect is essentially the planet somehow affecting the magnetic field of the star and its corona and so on um the evidence for that i'd say is is not very clear and there's there's no consensus that that actually that actually happens but the, it's it's certainly been suggested and some people have have, have presented some some evidence suggesting that that's the case Okay. I may follow up and, and note that the corona is a source for ultraviolet and X-ray emission. And stars uh, frequently have uh, coronae that, uh, that are, um, uh, have varying luminosities. The sun's is about a millionth as bright in the hard radiation as in the optical. But there are stars where it's a uh, part in ten to three, a thousandth. Whatever those numbers, uh, proximity and those luminosities suggest that the interaction between the hard radiation and the upper atmosphere of the planet would generate winds from the planet. So it is a mechanism by which you can evaporate the planets that are in proximity. And one can estimate the magnitude of this evaporation using simple models having to do with um, what's called energy limited escape, etc. And what you find is that these planets should have winds coming off them. They should be evaporating, but they're evaporating on time scales that allow them to have survived to this day. Hmm. When the original 51 Peg B was discovered, one of the questions was, when you're 100 times closer to a, a, a star like the sun than Jupiter is to the sun, and thereby, and, and therefore you have 10,000 times as much flux hitting the surface 
can that planet survive over a billion years or so uh, evaporation and and what we, what we came up with when the, in 1995 when these were first discovered was yes indeed the depth of the potential well for the giant planets was sufficient however you might have evaporated 10 percent oh. hmm. now the estimates of this evaporation rate aren't aren't very good but there are observations that indicate that for a number of these close planets there is evaporation going on and we know that in the solar system the planets are losing mass as well they're not losing as much mass uh, they're not in an extre in extremis, but um, they are losing mass. So this process of mass loss from planets is probably ubiquitous. And for hot Jupiters and for hot other types of planets that are sub-Jupiter, Neptunian, uh, super-Earths, etc., cetera, these, uh, this uh, evaporation may be a very important aspect of the general evolution of the planets. So the, the, the caller's uh, point is well taken. The coronae are the natural source for the, irradi the radiation that would cause evaporation. And there's an indication, observational and theoretical, that these things are evaporating. So that's part of the general uh, saga of these exotic objects. But it doesn't sound like you're saying it could be much to do with this inflation then. It's not really gonna be a mechanism for that. Just, just Probably so not, no, there's, yeah. there's not enough power. Okay. There's enough okay. power to get mass off over billions of years, but there's not enough power to heat the interior. Okay. Uh, here's another. Are there part. any? Are there any tidal effects? Well, as yes. Calo mentioned, yes. Maybe Calo yes. wants to talk about that. Well, tidal effects are observed in in many aspects of our Jupiter systems. We see them in the in how orbits are oriented relative to how the star is spinning. We see the effects of tides and how, how circular the orbits of exoplanets are. Uh, we see them in, even in, in as much as there are no very short period massive planets around certain types of stars, so presumably tides have driven those all the way into the star and destroyed them. So there's, there's numerous evidences that tides are affecting these, uh, these hot Jupiters to a large degree. And of course, this is due to the fact that you have this very massive planet very close to its star. But this wouldn't necessarily be part of the, or one of the factors to produce this extra heating. It well, could in some systems, if you somehow find a way that to make, so, so the, all of these systems are in circular orbits. Uh, mm. The ones that, are, that have the planets very close to their stars, the, the orbits are very, very circular. Mm. So the tides on the planet are not actually changing over time. Yeah, okay. So so that's not a heat source where the heat right. is actually being dissipated by tides is in the star. So the so for these very hot Jupiter systems, the heating is actually in the star and that's negligible compared to the star's own energy source. Ah. But if you have some mechanism to make the orbit not circular, so if, let's say you have a second planet or you have an outside star or whatever, that's slightly perturbing that orbit out of out of circularity, you can deposit a lot of energy that way. The problem is, observationally, that doesn't pan out. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, theoretically, you can dump a lot more power than you actually need in order to explain the uh, the inflation wow. using uh. this mechanism. Huh. Uh, but yeah. but again, yeah. you need to have non-circular orbits. Yeah, the problem also is, if I could follow, is that with non-circular orbits just left to themselves, this dissipation that would circularize the orbit would circularize it on very short time scales compared to the age of the systems. And so you'd be very lucky to have caught them at the time when this uh, tidal heating effect could be operating. Okay. And once you've inflated them, they'll just shrink again on time scales of tens of millions of years. Okay, so I've been reading the chat window here, and uh, Jason, 9, 93609, I read your first question, and I didn't understand it, so I'm going to ask your second question. <laughs> uh, maybe you want to reword that first question so I could ask. I didn't understand what you were getting at with that one, so try again. But the second question is, does the composition of these gas giants contain for particulates to form at a particular layer in the atmosphere? Yeah, in principle, I mean, you take Jupiter. 
if you look at the composition in Jupiter's atmosphere, uh, it is depleted of refractory species. You don't see silicon, you don't see iron. Well, uh, you don't see as much iron as there is. You don't see uh, those heavy species. And so it's, it's thought that at temperatures of about 2000 Kelvin, deeper inside the planet, there is a layer of uh, refractory species. Um, the region to which uh, the, the, those atmospheric species have rained out. So yes, it's it's not been, it's probably not of uh, great importance. It's it's not a large fraction of the mass or density, but hydrogen and helium being the dominant constituents. But it is a possibility, and it has some interesting consequences, which maybe someday we'll be able to verify. Okay. Also, we should point out that many, like Adam has noted on this many times, I mean, you know, is that uh, many of these planets seem to have hazes in their upper layers. So if you watch their, so as we were saying earlier, if you watch how, how big they appear in different wavelengths, they appear to not change very much from wavelength to wavelength, uh, much less than you would expect if from just typical atmospheres that you have. So if you put some water in their atmosphere, you expect the radius of the planet to change a lot more than what's actually observed. And this is an indication that there's something floating up that's indiscriminately absorbing light at all wavelengths. And there's even, so, so that may be some, some kind of condensate that's, uh, that's acting like a cloud layer or, or a, some sort of a haze in the upper layers of planets. And that has been seen observationally. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, I was referring to the, uh, the uh, normal refractory rock species and related species, uh, but Kahlo is, is, is bringing up the, the point that you could have hazes of some sort, which could be photochemical hazes, such as you see on Titan, the, the moon of Saturn, um, that are more um, uh, carbonaceous. Okay, well, we're almost out of time. I'm gonna end it with Philip W's question here for the panel. If the panel had time on the James Webb slash Kepler type telescope and also had access to HAPPI, uh, is it possible to image the same star and get real time chemical slash heat data? So observing these planet these planets with James Webb and your ground based telescopes, can you get are you is there any plans for that, do you think? Yeah, well so the the purpose of something like HAPPI or, or Kepler would be really to first find the planet and point that it's there and get the get the radius of the of, of the object. And then later with with JWST, you could follow up on all of the transits and and get the spectra uh, and and understand something about the composition of the atmosphere. So so certainly there's there's a, a hope or a plan to use JWST to follow up these these objects, but I don't think we would necessarily use them in in conjunction simultaneously to to study the planet. Yeah, that's a good point. The, these these ground-based instruments we're talking about have very wide fields. They're supposed to identify candidates, and then they get followed up with uh, higher resolution instruments like the James Webb Space Telescope. So, yeah. So, thank you guys for your questions. This was a great set of questions. You uh, you guys did a good job driving the hangout for me. So I appreciate that. I'm going to have to cut it off here because we've been uh, we spent our full hour. I want to thank our guests, uh, Dr. Joel Harbin, Dr. Adam Burrows, and Dr. Kahlo uh, Penev from all from the University of Princeton Astronomy Department studying these hot Jupiters. And uh, let me just ask you guys uh, really quickly, what's what's next for you guys? Are you guys looking at other hot Jupiters or are you just uh, going to do these more in depth? Oh, well, we have lots of more planets that we haven't published that we have to go through. <laughs> Yay, more, more hangouts! Many Yay. that I think are much more interesting, these two, two objects, I must say. But also, the, as we talked about, we're hoping to build the, or we're in the process of building this hat pie instrument that I think we'll be able to find much more interesting, longer period planets. And When's then, that supposed to come online? Um, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> within a year, perhaps. I, I don't want to, you know, make any promises, but... No, you cut out. What was that, a year? Uh, so you, maybe, <laughs> yes. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. Okay. All right. Well, good. We hope you guys will come back and, and help us uh, with more observations and more, more of these hot, hot Jupiters. Um, yeah, Craig Land is going, test, test, test. Yes, we didn't talk about tests, but that's a different <laughs> that's a different one. We know tests is coming online. Uh, and so I, so I want to thank you. I want to thank my guests for, for joining us and talking about this latest research. We hope you enjoyed this astronomical or, or astronomy uh, afternoon astronomy coffee with uh, myself and Dr. Carol Christian from the Center of Emer from, for Emerging Media. Next <laughs>
I, I did get it out. Uh, <laughs> next <laughs> next week, we'll be back with our Future in Space Hangout, where we'll be talking, I think, if I'm reading my emails right, we're going to be looking at uh, Hubble Space Telescope, getting an update on the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as uh, maybe some, uh, so. some plans for the future from NASA Goddard. So we'll see you guys next Thursday. Carol, thanks for joining us. It's great. I'm yeah. glad to have you back, and I hope you can get over your jet lag soon. <laughs> <We're completely laughs> exactly. Ended. All right. Thank you all guys very much for watching. And as always, keep looking, keep up. looking up.